Hi guys, how's everybody feeling? Are we tired? Are we ready for like a few more little talks? I think we're at the end of the, the rope here, so you guys can drink soon. Although I think some of you have been drinking the whole time. Um, <laughs> I'm Liz, as you guys just heard, and this is Mariana, and this is Lauren, and together hey we made, um, well, they do a lot of brilliant stuff on their own, but together we made a beautiful cookbook. So this is going to be all about whether you want to make a cookbook and learn the art of making a cookbook and the business of making a cookbook, or if you just want to make your photos way more gorgeous at home, these are your ladies. On my first cookbook shoot, I was just like bestering them with questions the entire time, and they were like, this is not what we're being paid for. Um, but I've learned so much from both of them. And now we're friends. <laughs> and now we're friends. And I still ask them a lot of questions. So I'm going to try to work this slideshow thingy. Yeah, this is what we're doing today. Um, all of the photos you're going to see are from my new cookbook, Healthier Together, which dropped April 9th. Um, and it's gorgeous. It's all healthy food for two people. Um, everything's gluten-free, dairy-free, and absolutely delicious. So we're going to talk about that from the beginning. So we're going to do how to get a book deal. I'm going to walk you guys through this. And then Lauren's going to talk about setting up a photo shoot, finding your photographic style. She'll kind of like go through some things you can do to make your photos better if you're terrible, like me, <laughs> or if you're poor. <laughs> um, and then Mariana's going to tell you how you can actually make the food look really, really beautiful on the plate. And then if we have some time, we'll take your questions. So... Look at me slide showing. <laughs> I'm really proud of myself. Okay, so the first thing, this is my first book cookbook. This is Glow Pop. So Glow Pops is a single subject cookbook. Healthier Together is not a single subject cookbook. A single subject cookbook is any cookbook that you see in the world, which is just one topic. So this can be like an ice cream cookbook or a grilled cheese cookbook or something like that. Often this is an easier cookbook to get for your first cookbook because people don't need to know you to buy it. They just need to know your idea. So with Glow Pops, what happened is I was doing a recipe series for women's health and it was healthy popsicles. And I was like, this is a really good idea for a cookbook. I don't think this is out in the world yet. And so I did my due diligence. I searched on Amazon. I looked at all the cookbooks that exist. And lo and behold, it wasn't. So I literally just Googled how to make a cookbook proposal. I found one online. I copied it with my own content, but I copied the format. And then I sent that off to an agent. So I think having an idea for a cookbook is so, so important. Even these days, if you're a very famous celebrity, they like if you have an idea for the cookbook. So then if people don't know who you are, they will buy your cookbook anyway. So that's why you'll notice like even Ina Garten, as I say here, she'll have like comfort food or cooking for parties or something like that. So I think thinking of a topic that interests you is a really good place to start and then getting your recipes out there. So when people tell me that they want to have a cookbook, but they don't have a blog, they don't have an Instagram and they're not pitching press. My day job for years, I was the food director at Mind Body Green, which is an online wellness website. And I started pitching press. I was a journalist long before that. But I think that People are always interested in really good content and getting your content out there on real media sites, not just your own blog or your own Instagram, is a really great way to show your legitimacy and show that your recipes work. And also it can give you ideas, like my Women's Health series is the impetus for Glow Pops. So I made a proposal. It was a... Uh, interesting. It wasn't, my husband helped me design it. Um, you don't need to design it, but essentially it's going to say your comp titles. It's going to say what your book is about. It's going to have a few recipes to show that you know how to develop recipes. And it's going to have like the topics that your book will cover, like sort of a table of contents. I think I had almost every popsicle that ended up being in the finished cookbook was in my proposal. And then my best, best, best tip to get an agent is to go to your local bookstore, find all of the books that are similar to yours, flip to the back of the book, and see in the acknowledgement section who they're thanking. They're always going to thank their agent unless they're a very bad person. And that person is an agent who represents a book that's very similar to your own book. So they're likely in your category. So then you can email that agent your proposal and that agent can get you your book deal. I always, there are a few publishing houses that will give you book deals without an agent. I don't recommend it. An agent's only going to take 15% and there's somebody who is in your corner. They're arguing for you. They're going to get you a bigger advance and they're also going to let it, you work with a much more significant publishing house. So I'm with Clarkson Potter, which is like a 
fancy house. Um, it's where like Chrissy Teigen and Ina is and stuff like that. And I wouldn't be able to publish there if I wasn't with an agent. And so then your agent will send it out to publishers. Hopefully there will be a bidding war. Uh, for this book there was, and then you get to make the decision then. After years of not being in power, you get to have the power, which is really fun. All right, so then after you get a book deal, this is Healthier Together, which again came out April 9th and is available everywhere books are sold. Um, <laughs> and you will get money. It will not be as much money as you thought you were going to get. And you're going to very quickly turn over a lot of that money to your photographer, who you will, you know, tell yourself is worth it, and you'll be like, I'll form a beautiful Hopefully. friendship Hopefully think so. <laughs> out of this relationship. But it's definitely a disheartening experience. I always tell people that you're not writing a cookbook to make money. You're writing a cookbook to get the world's best business card. It's a stamp of, legi of legitimacy that's very, very, very hard to get elsewhere, um, and I think that's why it's worth it. And if your first book does really well, then you can get a bigger advance for your second book. But really, you're going to probably lose about half of it to your photography right off the bat. The thing is, with any book, you're delivering the finished product. In a cookbook, obviously, the photos are so, so important. So some people choose to shoot their own photos. Um, I salute them. Uh, and then other people choose to work with a photographer. My publishing house would not let me shoot my own photos. They were like, we've got a Lauren for you. And they'll likely give you a list. And then the photographer will handle basically the entire shoot from there, which Lauren's going to talk about in a second. So that's the best thing about working with a photographer is that they will handle everything from there on out. So then you start actually developing your recipes. I got this book deal in April two years ago. So it's two years from the time that I signed my book deal to the time where the book came out. And that's pretty standard for books unless they're rushing it because it's you know, a timely topic. Like my friend did a book about a ketogenic diet and that was rushed out really quickly. But in general, it's gonna take about two years. And so you need to think, I really wanted Healthier Together to feel like a book that could become a classic but was really modern and fresh. And that's really interesting when it comes to health because health is changing so often. We always change our notions of what healthy actually means. And so it took me a while to get to what I called healthy in this book, which was a huge part of it. And it's something I've been asked about in a ton of interviews since then is like, okay, you were a journalist for years. You're defining what healthy means to you in this book. And so for me, it's gluten-free, it's dairy-free, just because those are things that tend to irritate and inflame a lot of people. But then other than that, it's just packing your food with as many vegetables as possible. So I talk to so many doctors, so many famous food people, and the one thing they all agree on is that 80% of your plate should be vegetables. If they're paleo, they're like the other 20% should be meats and proteins. And if they're, veg they're vegan, they're like, it should be chickpeas. But we're really only arguing over the last 20%. So I leaned into the first 80% and everything's filled with vegetables, it's going to balance your blood sugar, and then I did little, like, helpings of Ayurveda, like, I think you liked the Ayurvedic doll a lot um, in the cookbook. So that's, you have to figure out your perspective, and I think that that's especially important for a cookbook versus a blog or Instagram like that, because you can't change it. It's a really um, humbling experience to realize that you've created a product that can no longer be changed. Um, and I think that you need to figure out how you like this book to define you in a long-term way. And so that's when we're talking about what makes a cookbook recipe versus a blog or an Instagram recipe. To me, my blog and my Instagram is where I'm being a lot more responsive to the whims of what people want at any moment. And when I'm thinking about recipes for a cookbook, I really want something that's going to feel more concrete. It's going to last longer. People can take it out in five years and ten years. Um, and, and really continue to cook for it from it. And this has really worked for Healthy Together. And then you're developing a look and feel. So your art team at your publishing house will send you a mood board. So this is the first mood board that they sent me. And as you can see, it's like, it's pretty. The biggest thing that I wanted to change when I got all of this is I wanted my book to be really bright and colorful. I wanted all the photos to jump off the page. And I wanted my people photos to feel kind of like, cool and like snapshots at a really fun party that you wanted to be at. So when they sent me this, I said, I love what we have going here. And a few of these shots are from Glow Pops. Like that pineapple one is, oh, I'm obsessed with that. Mariana found a tiny pineapple and some raspberries that were still on the vine. It was amazing. But I was like, can we do it a little more casual, a little more candid, a little more hard light, and a little more bright color? So they sent me back this one, where you can already see the changes. And a mood board really, really dictates what your shoot is going to look like. I didn't realize how much it was up on the wall. 
the entire time. And Lauren would be like, oh, we got this type of shot, but we didn't get this type of shot yet. And I didn't realize how much you were actually paying attention to that. So I think that really knowing what your look and feel is, again, this is going to be something that's going to brand you for a very, very, very long time. So knowing that going in and having a really strong sense of your aesthetic and what you gravitate towards and what you're trying to say is incredibly important. And then you get to sit back and do nothing. Um, and then uh, we we talked. Obviously, we were working with the same team we had worked on on Liz's first book. But normally, when it when it comes to me, I present back with stylists based on a mood board um, that I think would be a good fit to work on the project. And there's a handful of probably two to three food stylists I already work with, and two to three prop stylists that I already work with. And there's more people on set than you probably realize. There's a food stylist, they have an assistant that's prepping all of the food for them. Sometimes they have two assistants. Sometimes that's a cost-effective decision. Sometimes it's a necessary decision. Sometimes it's a deadline decision. <laughs> um, and then we kind of take our budget and that also dictates how much we can do realistically. And I'll have a talk with Liz and say this is what we can accomplish. If, if your budget is $20,000, $30,000, or $45,000, and how that breaks down um, into how many shots we can realistically get. And sometimes that means I go back to her and say, you're going to have to prioritize what we need to get in the book, and sometimes we have to work with the publisher for that. But generally, we're shooting anywhere from 10 to 15 recipes a day yeah. for a cookbook, yeah. um, which I don't know for, for bloggers if that is a lot. but for That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I would imagine for one person that's doing everything realistically by yourself, you're probably getting a lot less. But for me, it, it's I have a prop stylist who is sourcing everything that we're shooting on. And then there's a food stylist. And we have a plan. At the beginning of the day, we talk through what our recipes are going to be. And the prop stylist will go everything over everything with Mariana or whoever our food stylist is and decide so that... Everyone has this very specific job that we can focus on and, and be this very well-oiled machine. And by working with people that I've worked with before, um, you're not worried about stepping on toes and formalities. You're doing your job. Well, and that's like a it. huge thing that I took as a I do my home blog and my home Instagram is going into each day that I'm shooting for myself, knowing what props I'm working with, knowing what I want to shoot. The way that you guys plan and orchestrate a shoot, I think makes it so you can accomplish so much more whether you're working on a large scale or a small scale. Yeah, and and also with the mood board, that that's going to tell me what kind of equipment I need. Um, if I'm going to have to if we're shooting in the middle of December and our sun is gone by three o'clock in the afternoon, and um, you know we're shooting at a studio that doesn't get south-facing light all day long, or whatever it is, and that and that tells us what kind of equipment and how much of that budget's going to have to go to that. What facing light is the best light? Uh, south. South. South-facing light. Yeah. And is there a bad direction light? I mean, it's just if you're direct or indirect. If you have, you can work with any kind of light. Uh, really, if you're shooting on a tripod, and we were having a conversation about talking about this, and I think that's something that a lot of people take for granted. Um, with still, you don't need as much light if you're shooting with a tripod because you can do a long exposure. Unless you live in a, you know, an apartment right next to the subway and you're dealing with shaking tripod the whole time, and that's been something we've had to deal with too. <laughs> but for the most part, um, if you have a window, you can make it work. And you'd be surprised what you can manipulate with reflectors, uh, scrims, light diffusers, maybe one simple daylight bulb. You don't need, I, and they were talking about this in the last panel with video, you don't need a whole giant kit. It, it actually puts you in an advantage if you learn how to work with less. Uh, so walk us through what an actual shoot day looks like. Coffee. Breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> No, we walk in in the morning, and we I walk over to the kitchen, and we'll run through our shot list so I can kind of wrap my head around um, where we need to be because I will typically get my chapters from the publisher so I know where things are going. And we want to make sure that compositionally things aren't looking the same, Not every well, unless it's an everything overhead book. You know, you don't want every single shot overhead. You don't want to use the same colors back to back. You want to think about the flow. It's really a team creative process. And so we will print out little Polaroids 
uh, as we go and plug them in and talk about um, for the next recipe, you know, how much time do I have and changing the light or changing the equipment based on that. We'll try and plan people shots all in the same day so that we're not paying for wardrobe and hair and makeup to come for a second day or a third day or how important that is. So can you talk to me a little bit about shooting on phones? Because I think a lot of people, do you need a DSLR to shoot beautiful photos? And can you shoot on an iPhone? Can you shoot on an Android? Is one of them better? Well, I can't speak to Android's camera lens, but it depends on what your, your use is for. If you're frustrated that you can't get a low angle, I'm sure everyone at this point has realized you're not going to get a good shot of food at a low angle. You're really only going to get a good shot of food at a high overhead shot. She said this to me on the phone the other day. She's like, everybody knows this. And I was like, I didn't know that. Thank you so much. <laughs> so apparently iPhones are only good for overhead shots. A food. A, a food. food. <laughs> what about portrait mode when you like go from the side with like... You know, I, I'm still an old iPhone user. I'm hanging on, so I can't speak to portrait mode over here. <laughs> okay. But I, I mean, I think that for if you're serious about elevating your business, um, you should... You don't have to get a, a super fancy camera. You can just... And don't, and don't just stick to the original lens that it comes with. Get one good portrait lens and get one good wide-angle lens, and that, that's all you really need to get started. And you don't have to spend a fortune on those. You could go into B&H or PhotoCare or Adorama if you're here in the city or go online and, and give them a call on the phone. And if anyone has specific lens questions, you can find me later, and I'll address them. But She's at Lauren Volo on Instagram if you'd like um, to DM her your photo lens questions. It doesn't have to be that fancy. You can you can get started with a simple DSLR model. So Lauren's doing all the work with like the light and making sure the composition is beautiful. But meanwhile, Mariana is making the food look beautiful, which is a huge thing that I didn't even realize with developing recipes is like if how much time you need to sp like pay attention to the styling, but also the creation of the recipe in the first place. You want to create food that's colorful and beautiful and all of that. So why don't you walk us through starting when you first get the mood board? So I get the mood board and I get the manuscript, which is, you know, just text. So I start to read through to try to put myself in the author's head. They've been working and developing these recipes for months, sometimes years. And I want to understand that voice behind that manuscript. And also as I read through the head notes, the recipe, see what the tone is, the language, how the recipe is written really directs how that person feels about the food that they're making. And so my job is to take those recipes without, you know, I ask to not send any test shots so that I don't get jaded or confused. I just, I read through the ingredients and I start to think about what this book is going to look like from the food perspective. I look at the mood board and, you know, we have all these words in the industry like messy or, or really pulled together and the textures. And I think throughout the years that has changed radically, don't you think? Oh yeah, the, there's definitely trends with where things are. Liz wanted this to be a book that wasn't of the moment, especially with a two-year publishing date. So we had to be really conscious of making sure we weren't doing too much of one thing. So it wasn't like, oh, that's the book that shot all in bright light or... Yeah. Uh, every shot has yeah. something spilled, right? Yeah. Or the salt on the side of the plate. Although I'm always like, make it more messy, make it more messy. <laughs> More green onions. And we, can you talk we to us a little that. bit about the props, like particularly where home chefs can get some of the beautiful props that you use without spending a ton of money? So, I mean, I, something that I think is very important to start your prop collection is to start very simple. Things that you can use over and over again that don't become repetitive, you know, that they can just sort of blend in. But I really recommend finding local ceramists, you know, people who are making beautiful pieces, that can become kind of like your signature, your style. Uh, flea market is a great resource, especially for textiles, for things to layer and give texture. Sometimes they don't even have to be tabletop things. You know, I mean, you can find pieces of slate, pieces of marble, great things. And you know, when you travel, you can find incredible elements to just enhance the shot, basically. And what about the ingredients? Because like the tiny pineapple or the raspberries on the, I can't even find edible flowers. And I look at, you know, some people on Instagram and I'm like, I, I have bodegas to shop from. 
Well, this is one of my favorite parts of the process is sourcing the ingredients because it's basically the canvas, right? You use all of those elements to create beautiful food. Before, when food styling was mostly fake, the, and also the appetite appeal wasn't that. It wasn't about that real, organic, beautiful, imperfect food. So now, shopping at farmer's markets, finding vendors and makers and, and farmers who can ship directly to me with leaves, with branches, I think that's really where the magic is. And, and then there's also a challenge of shooting a very summery book in January. Yeah. Where then Which you we have did. to this find. This whole yeah. book was shot in January, and there was a lot of fresh produce and stuff like that. And I think that is an interesting. Do you just go buy off season in Whole Foods? Well, the thing is, apologize to the environment. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there's some things that you really cannot find. Yeah. You know, like cherries at this time of the year, you cannot get anywhere for two weeks because they're done harvesting in Chile, and they haven't started here. And so I told the client this week, like no, we cannot get cherries. And they were like, now you can find anything anywhere, well, not cherries or pomegranates. <laughs> so we're running out of time, but I just want to walk through a few of the beautiful images. And maybe if there's like one takeaway you guys could kind of share from each slide that people could use at home when they're styling their own photos. Yeah, I will say just quickly, um, and I'm sure you all try this, you might be setting up for a shot, especially if you're making it yourself in one specific way. You're, you're prepping it to be shot from overhead, and then you get it and you, you think you're done. Um, don't be afraid to take it further. Take that slice out, see if there's another angle that's better. Change the light around. You'll see in some of the other slides that walk around the table and really look at it and see what is inspiring to you because it changes really, really quickly, especially with food. Um, maybe it's waiting for a minute for something to gloss over and melt. And, and that's something that Maddie is really good at pointing out, especially at four o'clock at the end of the day when you're tired and wait, wait for it, wait. <laughs> yeah. And do you have any for this one? Like, I know that, that the falafel flatbread, which is the one that looks sort of like a pizza, that ended up being the cover shot, and that was such a beautifully styled photo. Could you kind of walk us through maybe what you're thinking there? What I loved about this shot was that Liz had a, re a list of ingredients that you couldn't top your, your falafel with. And so I got to have a little bit of a creative freedom here to say, okay, I'll put whatever I would put on mine. And so this was really really fun and how it's imperfect but beautiful. Uh, the way, is it zucchini or is it cucumber? I think it's... That's a cucumber. The way that I did the cucumber ribbons kind of like flowing through, the spilled herbs. Yeah, I love it. Could you talk to me for one second about when you're actually prepping the ingredients? Because I think that's something I run into when I'm doing this stuff at home. I would see the uh, cucumber and I would just shred it or chop it and then it wouldn't look pretty. How do you sort of approach making sure ingredients are always in their most beautiful form. So when you take the photo, you're capturing that. I mean, I think um, reading through the list of ingredients and envisioning what they're gonna look like. And things like cucumbers, herbs, things that you want them to stay crisp, you have to do in the last minute. There are things that you can prepare before and it works, but I think the closer to the shot, the better. And do you use things like special tools to make stuff beautiful? So my tweezers are the extension of my hand, which really enhances my OCD and everything. It's like, um, it's really, I mean, mostly I can show up anywhere and style, but not without my tweezers. You know, I think <laughs> that that's, yeah. Could somebody just use tweezers from like a Dwayne Reed? Will that work or do you need special ones? No, so now um, kitchen stores, okay. professional chef stores sell long, beautiful, really cool tweezers. Okay, so that's the, if you're going to buy one thing, buy some tweezers. <laughs> All right, Lauren, this is a light thing. So can you kind of walk us through what was happening with the light here? Uh, yes, so the shot on the left is not in the book and the shot in the middle is. And we had thought we had finished the shot and that is just one of those moments where we had taken the the light diffuser out to pack up the shot and walk away, and then realized that we messed that up and we needed to take an extra one. So that was just pushing it further, don't being afraid to uh, speak up, and uh, even if that's yourself, uh, push yourself a little bit further. And the next shot, we struggled with that shot for like, for an, like a long I don't time, know, an hour and a half, and we were gonna call it and just try it another day, and 
re-envision the whole thing, get some new props. Um, well, and, and just before, it's called moon milk. It's, it's like an milk. Ayurvedic moon milk. Um, and it's something you drink before bed to have a nice night's sleep, so. Well, yeah, that was, an, that was another light situation where we just, uh, I think we shifted the whole surface into the other side of the apartment, which was a big pain in the butt, because you're, you, again, you think that you're done, and then you're like, oh, but, you know, when you're shooting daylight, and that sometimes that is a budgetary thing, you are chasing the sun around. And we were shooting in Mariana's loft, and the sun had gone from, I think, you're east to west on an angle. North to south. It is north to south. Okay, so we had to go to the other side of your apartment and move all of the furniture to catch the end of the sun, and that's how we made that work. And while we're talking about light, can you just quickly speak to... Do you always recommend natural light, especially for home photographers? Do you think there's a small artificial light system if you have a full-time job and you're coming up and shooting at night? I think you should learn daylight first. Um, personally, from my experience, I think it teaches you how to see. It teaches you how to manipulate what's there. When you're setting up lights, um, you find things that work, and you tend to get into a habit of just making that same picture over and over again. I think if you're working with daylight, at least for me, it's, it's what inspires me. Uh, it's, it changes the color of what you're working with, um, which sometimes isn't a good thing for a commercial, but for usually cookbooks and editorial, that doesn't matter. And you, you have to do what works for you. And it is obviously a, a much more affordable thing. And when you're getting started yourself, that's important. All right, Mariana, do you want to talk us through this one? This is the uh, chia rose pistachio rice pudding. So we started shooting this recipe overhead. So we had the rose petals. Remember, we talked about the petals, if they should be fresh, if they should be dried, organic, you know, all, the whole thing. The napkin came in, and we had the shot. And right when I'm about to take it away, I to sort of like kneel down to take everything offset and I saw how the honey had pulled on the side of the glass and I thought I said to learn no 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 have a look at this I think this could be even prettier and so they used both right yeah so yeah. the one on the left or the overhead is the section opener and then the other one is in the shot on the book and sometimes you know you can really control things with food with the tweezers with really placing planning it but also letting food do its thing, you know, things move, things shift. Sometimes letting something sit for a little while and then take the shot, you can find something magical. I've even had the experience before I've started eating a dish and then I feel like it looks prettier after somebody sort of dug into it. And so I think the biggest, one of the biggest things I learned from you guys was to never consider it done until it's actually done. Like, just keep giving it. My husband hates me because I'll, I, I hate food photography, honestly, which is one of the reasons I love writing cookbooks because you get to work with people like this instead of shooting it for yourself. Um, but I'll, you know, spend five or six hours working on a recipe, developing it, making like seven versions of banana bread, and I'll come set it up on my table and be like, ugh, I can't get it. And he'll be like, you, you spent five minutes trying to photograph that. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm tired. Um, but they really pursue the shot until they've absolutely nailed the shot. And I think that giving, if you're going to take the time to develop the recipe, to create the content, give yourself that extra time to make it look really, really beautiful. And I think that's a huge thing that I learned from them. All right. This is a, we have like a people shot here. And some, do you guys have anything to say about this one? Um, oh, no. I, was that when we just went rogue at the end? I think I, we just went off tripod. We're like, okay, let's just see what else we can grab. Because the publisher will request, you know, these are the 50 recipes that I have to shoot. And then they'll be like, please just get anything else that you can. It, uh, we'll shoot blank surfaces and put type over it. We'll shoot beautiful ingredients just because that could go on an acknowledgement page. That could be used on a website. That could be used for promotional materials. All those little details start noticing and and don't let them fall through the cracks. This was just an example of what we were talking about earlier. Well, and again, I think that's huge for home cooks is we're in an age where we're all trying to create so much content all the time to sort of feed the beast. So when you're making a recipe, you can do a prep shot, you can do an ingredient shot, you can do one of it in its whole form, you can do one of it served up on a plate. I think the more that you can use whatever your hero food item is in as many different ways as possible and get like 12 different shots to use, the happier, the more your future self will thank you for sure. Yeah. 
All right, so we have time for a little bit of Q&A. If anybody has any Qs, maybe we have As. Um, do we have a mic that we could? I know you're loud. You said that earlier, but we'll give you a mic. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Blessing. Hi. Hi. Um, you said to use, like, well, I do cakes, and so that is what I'm always trying to take pictures of. And for me, my kitchen is in the middle of the house. So there are no windows, like all of the, so it's like, it's literally in the middle of the house, like there are no windows. I have n no hope. I have a ring light. What other suggestions do you have? Because I mean, I think a ring light is great for shooting people, but if you, if you can just, even renting equipment, if you know you have a specific shoot day and you wanna try and figure out what works for you in your space before you commit to buying something, if you truly don't have any daylight, but if you don't need to shoot in your kitchen and you have a window in your bedroom, you know, put that up it's against there. It's difficult to move a three-tier cake to your bedroom. <laughs> to move, sorry, A three-tier cake to your bedroom. Oh, a three-tier cake, yeah. Um, it might be worth setting up a little spot in your kitchen with a light that you can pull in and out, just like a little uh, daylight balanced anything. There's tons of options now for people that walk around and do video, and if you can figure out the color balancing on your, in your camera, it's a lot of just trial and error and finding what works for, you, for your space. But renting is a good place in that specific situation. Okay. And if you want to talk about where you can rent equipment, I can talk Find about it Find you later. later. Yeah. We'll do. Or you can DM her on Instagram, at Lauren Bolo. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, over there. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Davis. Um, I had a question. You talked about foods that were not available in certain seasons. Where can we go when we're, do, you know, we're about to make a dish or something like that to find out what foods are in season and which ones are not? So, I mean, basically, if you Google produce for fall, produce for winter, and so on, you find a pretty specific list. So now you can find almost anything, you know, that's out of season. Strawberries any time of the year, tomatoes any time of the year. But when you actually buy those things in their season, then you have all the varieties, right? Like when you go to a farmer's market and you have plums and it's plum season, you have 18 colors, shapes, leaves, forms, shadows. I mean, it's, it's amazing. So trying to work with food that's in season, it's much better visually and environmentally and everything. And sometimes people will have things out of season just left over from a photo shoot. So people within the network will post on Insta stories looking for pomegranates. Does anyone have any pomegranates left? <laughs> and then and sometimes that works. It's also when you're though. Googling, make sure you put in your location because the seasons in California are gonna be different than yeah. the seasons in New York. So Google like in season May, New York or something like that. Um, all right, in the blue blazer, can we get her a mic? Hi, I'm Synovia from Tasty on a Budget. I have a question about styling food. How do you feel about um, some people use uh, like a way to make the food in inedible when you're styling them as far as taking photos about that? How do you feel about that? But how do you mean? That so like using... Um, like glues yeah, or like stuff glues, like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is so that he, here's what people always ask me. Like, so is the food real? Who gets to eat it? Mm -hmm. And before, we eat it. Right. In this case now, yes. Before, when it was film photography, food would sit on set for a very long time because we would have to wait for the Polaroid and it was a longer process. So of course, that ice cream was completely melted, things would dry out, but now with digital, the process is much faster. Mm -hmm. So using fake things or spraying lacquer or using elements that are not food or edible was not really necessary. And then for me, my philosophy is to not waste any food. You know, I like for us to eat it after, for people to take it home. And believe it or not, sometimes that's a challenge, you know, trying to give the food away. You know, like my doormen eat very well. <laughs> We're always sent, you know, the Uber driver gets the cookies. It's when you're shooting 15 dishes a day, 
for But you will 10 use days. like a few little tricks that are edible tricks to make stuff look more delectable. Like I've seen you maybe spray with some oil. Could you talk a little bit or like with water? Dry, I don't know. Like I feel like I've seen you do stuff to make food look more delicious, but it's still edible. Right, and you can use tricks. For instance, when I make a roast, you know, I save that parchment paper with all those drippings and I use a brush and get the drippings to brush the roast after. A spray bottle is really useful. Um, what is this a good trick? Um, putting herbs in ice water to kind of like bring them back to life. Little things that are real, but that help. All right, um, unless anybody has any other pressing questions. Do we have time for one more? No, we don't. All right, well, come and find whoever you want to talk to after, and thank you guys so much. Um, if you guys want to see my cookbook, my husband will be carrying it around later. He's the guy with the cute sunglasses. <laughs> Wave, hi, yay. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. Thank, thank, you, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.